A dozen friends decide to go to a nightclub on their Saturday night out. They're lined up outside the club. The hottest music from the week is blasting on the other side of the doors. Everyone who's anyone wants to get in. The bouncers at the door are checking IDs. The friends flash their IDs to these bouncers. And then all of a sudden, they all turn around and walk away. They look dejected, and as you keep watching them, they go to get some frozen yogurt. Let's assume that the club only permits people who are older than 21 years of age. How would that shape your perception of the group's average age? Is the group's average age higher or lower than 21 years old? Like most people, you probably believe in the majority. You believe that the side that has the most people on it has an advantage. You probably believe that in order to convince a group of people, you need to convince most of them to your side. If you're a politician, you might believe that to win an election, you need to convince the majority of voters to vote for you. And if you believe all of these things, guess what? You'd be wrong. Very wrong. In World War II, there were military leaders who believed in this myth of the majority. There were the kind of people who ordered entire cities to be leveled in order to win the war. Their predecessors in World War I believed in the majority as well. They believed the side that killed the most people would win, so they took to throwing their soldiers into machine gun meat grinders, all in a futile attempt to end the war. They were all wrong. In the world of business today, your average business person also believes in the myth of the majority. They believe that in order for a business to make profit, they must make and sell products and services to this mythical majority. They believe that if you have a bigger share of the market, then surely you must get a bigger share of the profits. Like you, if you believe in the majority and the battlefield generals of yesteryear, these business people are also wrong. But let's get back to our club. The people inside are dancing away, enjoying the pounding music and the buzz from their drinks. What would you guess is the average age of the people dancing inside of the club? Is their average age higher or lower than the group of 12 friends who were turned away at the door? If you believe in the majority, you'd guess that the people inside the club have to have a higher average age than the people who were turned away at the door. Because the people at the door were turned away since clearly they were not old enough to be admitted. But here's the thing. The average age of the group is actually a silly question to even ask about. The group isn't checked for its average age. Each individual member of the group presents their identification. The ones who are too young are turned away. Everyone else who is old enough can enter. For example, it could be that two people in the group of 12 are aged 20, and the other 10 people in the group could be aged 50. The group's average age would then be 45. But again, the average doesn't matter. It could be that the other 10 people are all 21, and they can still enter. Even though 10 of the 12 people are old enough to enter the club, they don't. Because two of their well-regarded friends are not permitted. The entire group refuses to enter the club. The interaction between the people within the group is far more informational about the group's behavior. The friends are loyal to one another. They're not going to abandon two people in the group to have fun at the club without them. 
since it's therefore easier for the whole group to get frozen yogurt than go to the nightclub, the group in fact goes and gets frozen yogurt. That's an incredible thing if you stop to think about it. The majority of the group didn't get its way. The minority did. But there are a couple of ingredients that are absolutely necessary for this to work. First, the majority needs to care enough about the minority not to ditch them in the first place. Second, the minority must be absolute in its refusal or inability to go to the nightclub. Our group of friends have all of this. The two 20-year-olds are really cool, and the group doesn't want to abandon them. And the 20-year-olds have no choice. The law says because they're under 21, they can't get into the nightclub. There's a third critical ingredient. There needs to be an option everyone can agree on and can go to. The option might not be ideal for the majority, but it must be something that they wouldn't mind. And what's more mundane than frozen yogurt? Not many people are over the moon in love with frozen yogurt, but also at the same time, no one is deeply opposed to frozen yogurt. So, the whole group goes and gets frozen yogurt instead of going to the nightclub. In other words, the preferences of the majority are determined by the stubborn minority. Mathematician Nassim Taleb calls this minority rule. In the world of physics and systems, this property of systems is called renormalization groups. Ever wondered why Hollywood movie studios make so many movies that are rated PG-13 or below? Is it because most of the world are teenagers and younger? Is it because teenagers spend more money than other groups? No. But when groups of people or families are deciding to go to a movie, minority rule effects are at play. If a movie is rated R and you have younger kids in the group, you're not going to go take them to that movie. A PG-13 movie, on the other hand, is edgy enough to be interesting to you as an adult, but not so edgy that you can't go with your younger son or daughter. Advertising genius Rory Sutherland believes this is why a restaurant like McDonald's is such an incredibly successful food chain. Their food is obviously not the highest quality that you can get, but it's not necessarily the worst food in any given area. McDonald's is mediocre. But guess what? In a pinch, when you can't agree on something, with something mediocre, you know no one will be over the moon happy. But at the same time, you won't have to rush to the emergency room with a serious foodborne illness after eating it. Renormalization groups can scale up to unbelievable proportions. But in order to do so, you need one more quality. Diffusion. If you count the number of people who speak English around the world, no other language comes close. And yet, throughout history, the number of native English speakers has been a minority of the planet. But English has had an advantage that other, more popular native languages haven't had. It's been diffused throughout the world over the last 400 years. You see, the English language has a very useful quality. Broken English is more understandable than broken forms of many other languages. So all around the world, over hundreds of years, you end up with a scene that goes something like this. Imagine everyone in a room speaks their own native language perfectly, and they also speak every other language, albeit in an equally broken way. Groups of multilingual people gather around, and given the choice between speaking broken Mandarin or Spanish or Pashto, the native speakers of Mandarin, Spanish, and Pashto instead opt to use broken English. Why? Because broken English is more forgiving and understandable. 
the language diffuses through the world. Over time, this effect compounds, because with more people using broken English over other broken languages, English also becomes the language that most people will eventually have in common. English, in effect, becomes the McDonald's of linguistics. It's the language that most everyone is okay with, and that's all you need. They don't need to be perfect at it, they just need to be understood. You zoom forward a few hundred years and bring in some other effects, and a language from a series of small islands in the North Atlantic has become the de facto language of the cosmopolitan and interconnected world. And the idea continues. If a small number of people in every room all around the world prefer English as a language for communication, and everyone else doesn't mind using English, everyone speaks English. That is the power available to a stubborn but well-diffused minority on a global scale. Now all of this makes me wonder if the pop music that's blasting away in the club is actually really just unpopular music that a few people love, and most everyone else doesn't love, but doesn't happen to mind. Is everyone trying to get in the club because they love the nightclub, or because a few people in each group of friends love it, and everyone else doesn't mind going to the nightclub? Look at all kinds of popular preferences throughout the world. Are these things popular because everyone loves them, or are they popular because a few really, really, really love them, and everyone else simply doesn't mind. If you enjoyed the show, please consider going to iTunes and leaving us a good review, or tell someone who might enjoy this episode all about it. Thanks for listening.